So with that being said, I am going to turn it over to Lauren, who's going to be talking to us about Vietnam, Vietnam era cards tonight. And uh, I've been looking forward to this for a couple of weeks now. So. so tonight I'll be talking about postcards, posters, and iconography of the Vietnam War. When I tell people that I collect uh, postcards of the Vietnam War, a lot of people are surprised that there were postcards that were produced. And other people wonder why I would bother with postcards when there are uh, so many photographs that were available. Well, I collect them because of the important role that they played. And this may have been the last time that um, servicemen relied so heavily on the mail to stay in touch with their family. And postcards were produced for propaganda purposes and also for political activism. And they added to our understanding of the impact of war. So I thought it might be important, though most people are pretty familiar with the war, to just give a little context. And uh, Vietnam became a French colony in 1877. And then in World War II, the Japanese forces invaded Vietnam and fight off the Japanese occupiers and the French colonial administration, the political leader Ho Chi Minh, who was inspired by communism, formed the Viet Minh, or the League for the Independence of Vietnam. But in 45, uh, the Japanese were defeated in World War II, and so they withdrew their forces from Vietnam, and that left uh, Emperor Bao Dai in control. But the Viet uh, Minh Army, led by Ho Chi Minh, they took over the city of Hanoi and declared a democratic republic of Vietnam. So in 49, uh, the French set up the state of, of Vietnam uh, in the south of Vietnam in Saigon and claimed it as the capital. So conflict between the north and the south continued until there was a uh, Viet Minh victory over the French at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu in 54. But in 1954 with the Geneva Convention uh, or the Geneva Conference, they split Vietnam into the North and the South at the 17th parallel. And you can see that right here on this old uh, Stars and Stripes map of the war area. And so, um, and the idea that was that Ho Chi Minh would be controlling the North and Bao in the South, and that they would eventually um, hold some um, elections to decide on reunification and who would be in power. But um, the Cold War was intensifying and Eisenhower pledged to support South Vietnam. And um, in 55, uh, the anti-communist uh, politician pushed Bao aside and he became the president of South Vietnam. But he mounted a brutal campaign to crack down on the communist sympathizers. And, um, and that led the Viet Cong and Ho Chi Minh to fight back with attacks on the government officials and other targets. The US was worried that Vietnam was going to fall to communism. They worried about this. Uh, they had this theory, the domino theory, that if one country fell to communism, then a lot of other countries would also fall. So uh, Kennedy, uh, President Kennedy increased support to the South Vietnamese. And, and then in 64, um, North Vietnamese torpedo boats attacked two US de destroyers in the Gulf of Tonkin, or so the official record says. And um, Johnson ordered retaliatory bombing and then got um, uh, Congress passed the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, which gave him war powers. So I'd like to start with a postcard. Many of you may be familiar with this card. It's a Coral Lee postcard. And she uh, made postcards of the Carter administration and also Reagan administration. And this was produced by Mike Roberts. It's um, President Reagan visiting the Vietnam Veterans Memorial uh, not long after its dedication in 82. And I start with this postcard because uh, the inscription on the back I find to be um, well pertinent to uh, people's um, perception of the war and what happened during the war. 
And uh, the narrative on the back says, just as the Vietnam War was enveloped in controversy, so was the monument dedicated mm -hmm. to the soldiers of the Forgotten War. Well, I had always um, heard the, that the Korean War was considered the Forgotten War. So I wasn't sure what they meant here with that term. And I was thinking that, well, maybe what they meant was that it was the war that many people were trying to forget. Um, this war, yes, it was very controversial. It divided the country and people were just trying to um, put it behind them. And I think part of why it had been a controversial war uh, was because it was the first war that was televised. And so we there was less government uh, control of the narrative. And we saw firsthand with the reports um, every night with the uh, on the news of what was happening in the war. And particularly, we saw the soldiers who had been killed in the war, their remains uh, coming home. So it was um, it was a war that uh, that was more up close and personal in a lot of ways than previous wars. And that was one of the reasons uh, that made it very divisive. So also the uh, they're saying the postcard was saying that the memorial itself was controversial, and probably one of the main reasons was um, it wasn't a traditional memorial like they had in the past of figurative heroic sculpture. Uh, instead, it was just a wall that had the names of all the um, men who lost their lives uh, fighting in the war. And that was over 58,000 names. And so uh, the controversy was such that a lot of people criticized it and said, well, it's just a monument to defeat, a monument to failure. But I think a lot of other people uh, would disagree and find it to be actually a, um, a, a memorial of individual sacrifice and uh, that every life that was lost was a life uh, that mattered. Here's another more modern postcard of the wall. And it just shows um, how large the wall uh, had to be to accommodate all these names. And I took um, some uh, excerpted remarks from the most recent commemoration of the National Vietnam War Veterans Day, which was on March 29th. And these are from Wayne Peacock. And he says, during the conflict, political controversy and disagreement were sadly misdirected toward those who had served our nation. And the warriors returned from Vietnam. They received not a hero's welcome nor appreciation. Um, instead, they got apathy and anger and hate. So you can see that even after all these years for this particular veteran, it still um, causing, causes a lot of emotional pain. And so I think a lot of people find the wall to be a place uh, for healing and for solace. So how did I come about to know that there were postcards from uh, the Vietnam War? Well, I inherited uh, postcards from my father and in that collection, there were a lot of Mike Roberts postcards and I was finding a lot of them um, in that collection of Vietnam. And I was a bit curious because I thought, well, I know there was a war going on during this time. And yet these postcards um, seem like life was um, pretty normal. And so, you know, there were a lot of city scenes and it, uh, you, you know, it just uh, seemed like uh, regular, um, regular life. And then I came across, across this postcard that was not a Mike Roberts postcard. It was kind of older, it was the Independence Palace, and it was actually a postcard that had um, been sent to someone. And it was the best I could tell around 1965. And it says, uh, during, um, during the day, the war is invisible, but you hear and see it at night. The bombs land closely and the tracers are like uh, scurrying red ants. In the city, it's like no war at all until a hand grenade blows up here and there. So that kind of explained um, all these postcards where showing life uh, could be going on pretty close to normal. And then not long after that, 
uh, at our postcard club in San Francisco, a speaker came. Um, Mike Roberts' son had read a, written a biography about his father's work. And Mike Roberts, as many of you know, was a very prolific uh, producer of postcards. And he had the nickname as the Postcard King. So um, he, uh, the father, Mike Roberts, had planned to write a memoir and had written a lot uh, toward that, but had passed away before he got a book together. So his son compiled a biography. And in the book, there was a, a small chapter about the postcards produced about Vietnam, land of contrasts. And in it, it explained that uh, he, Mike Roberts made five trips to Asia to make post, he had the contract to make postcards for the military post exchange. And, but there's a funny anecdote in there that said uh, Saigon shops and hotels had the postcards for sale long before the PX got them because locals were used to unload the ships and they would take some of the merchandise and sell it. So that might be why you can still find a lot of these um, non-military postcards that Mike Roberts produced, particularly if they weren't posted. Uh, you can um, still find a lot of them online. And then another anecdote, um, Mike Roberts talks how he uh, was able to get the pictures and he camouflaged his activities. He wore a traditional Vietnamese outfit and a coat with big sleeves to hide his camera. So there are a lot of um, scenes in the rural area and up the river um, of the people and um, places of worship. There's aerial shots. I don't know if he went up in um, some kind of aircraft himself to get these, but there are a lot of aerial shots and um, just general scenes of, of Vietnam. And this was about the only one non um, direct military card that I came across that showed some soldiers. And so it looks like some South Vietnamese soldiers are, you know, regularly patrolling to look for trouble. But then I finally came across some military postcards produced by Mike Roberts. And um, the one on the left is street fighting in Saigon outside government grounds. And the other is um, troops forging a, a swollen stream and photo credit is given to Black Star. So I'm thinking that's probably a military photographer that Mike Roberts probably was not on scene for these postcards. These two particular postcards had not been posted. And so there was only a very, um, there was only one image used in the book written by his son about the military postcards. And I felt lucky to find the one that looks like it's cropped differently, but the same image that's in the book. And this one was actually posted by a soldier. And it says, well, this is the last postcard we have until we get some new ones. Today was a bad day for me, I'll tell you tomorrow. So um, this goes to show you that they were being um, supplied with postcards. He mentions a bad day, he doesn't write about it on the postcard, so I'm assuming maybe he's going to write more about it in a letter. The next card, I like this card, it's called Mail Call, and it does uh, another indicator of how important mail was to stay in touch with families and keep up the uh, servicemen's morale, those have, have to assume as sacks and sacks of mail. And on the back of that one, Dear sis, by the time you get this card, you will be close to getting married. So, um, you know, this is an indication that um, uh, these people, you know, when they're away serving in the war are missing important family events and rites of passage. And the next postcard, heavy weapons at work. And the same writer as the last postcard, dear mom and dad, Please write as often as you can, okay? So another indicator of um, how heavily uh, the servicemen were relying on uh, word from home to stay in touch. So uh, these two postcards, they uh, are not military, but they were used by a serviceman 
and he didn't post them. He must have uh, put them in an envelope like a letter, but he's using these cards to uh, explain what, um, you know, the country looks like. And once again, these postcards are the only ones we have here. Sure hope you like them. My current job isn't too bad as the roads are pretty secure. No one gives me a hard time. And this next postcard also used by a serviceman to uh, explain how things are for him in country. And um, let's see my little cursor here. So um, he says the thick area on the other side of the river is what our area looks like, nothing but jungle. We're still clearing it out and starting to build our permanent buildings. And he also drew a little arrow over here and he explains that's where they were when they first came and that was a hospital ship. This is an aerial view. This is some of the good looking part of the country. I've taken some pictures. Uh, as soon as they're developed, I'll send some home so you can see. So apparently the soldiers who had um, a camera, they had some facility or some way to get their uh, photos developed, but they also uh, seem to be using a lot of these uh, postcards provided to them that were made by Mike Roberts to uh, send home and, and show family what it looked like. And this one, first to Bien Ho, then to Long Bin, and now I'm in July. Tulai is right on the coast, another dump. So this is obviously a young man uh, not, not too happy about being where he is. This one is a tank patrol on the DMZ. And on the back, it says, I hear you're not doing too good in school. You better get your ass in gear. I got this postcard over at Eddie's base. It rained all day. Well, this might be a little cautionary tale, for uh, staying in school since there are a few um, spelling and grammar errors, but it just shows you that this young man who um, ordinarily functions in some sort of role such as a big brother or possibly an uncle, he is um, far away and he can't be right there to help this young man stay on the uh, right path. And so he's trying to do that remotely through the mail. Here's another card, camouflaged recoilless rifle emplacement. And on the back, well, only 155 days to go and I'll be back to the world. And so you see that in a lot of these postcards that um, we've um, both myself and another fellow club me member, uh, Dan uh, Cudworth have uh, been able to accumulate that there are a lot of references to how many days they have yet to go. So you can, you can see the servicemen, the soldier mentally uh, clicking off the days. The flamethrower thwarts possible ambush. And uh, this writer is a dad to his young son. He writes, um, he tries to write upbeat postcards to his son. And this one, he's saying that he has uh, made a movie of a cargo plane that'll show him when he gets home. And he asks his little boy to be good for mommy and daddy and that he misses him. And then this is a suspenseful moments for a tunnel rat. Another card from the same sender to his little boy talking about he's been in Vietnam for four months and um, it won't be long before he gets to come home and they'll have some good times. And, um, and by then his little boy will be in regular scouts cause he'll be seven years old. This one is resupplying Highland installation. And interestingly, there is a reference on the back of this one. I got this postcard to show you what it looks like over here. This is that chopper base I told you got hit. This postcard is an aerial view, and there's a um, credit given to James Pickerel for this shot, and it's up in a helicopter. You can see a helicopter in the background. There's a gunner, and it says, here's what Vietnam looks like from the air. Almost all rice paddies. These choppers fly over our base, and this is um, uh, on K Airfield. 
And this is, um, these are all Mike Roberts postcards, Asia Pacific Productions with a photo credit to John Woolrich. Here are army tanks in the rice paddies, South Vietnam, and then a night convoy moves cautiously. Um, that's on the right. Here's uh, three aerial views. There's a supply drop, air support for ground troops in the middle, and then a sea sprite rescue operation in the Tonkin Gulf. And then along the river, we've got river patrol, ready for duty, land or water, operation game warden, intercepting enemy supply sampans on, down on the right. And here are some um, uh, aircraft used and uh, some helicopter in action, South Vietnam. We've got a C-130 unloading fresh troops and operation cleanup with uh, trucks down on the right. And then truck convoy winding its way up from the coast on the left and missionary cathedrals dotting the countryside. Uh, with a tank in front of the church on the right. So uh, Mike Roberts, he did produce um, some folders. Uh, the folders that I've seen mostly were the uh, non-military, uh, but there is this one in Dan's collection that is military views front and back. And um, uh, some of them were used for individual that are just in this one pack that we have were used for individual um, postcards and um, and they um, uh, um, Peter what? Cheeto and so they um, sorry my cat is howling anyway a lot of the postcards uh, were used for individual postcards but the ones I'm going to show here I have not found in uh, the individual cards. These continue to be cards that uh, have not found as individual cards. Um, if they were produced as individual postcards, they've either been uh, retained in personal collections or fewer were produced and uh, are just, you can't find them. Okay, so now we'll go to postcards that were, um, not Mike Roberts postcards, we found a couple of them. And uh, this one says, boy, is it hot over here? Summer is just starting. These helicopters are always flying around. You wouldn't believe this place. I think I'm dreaming, it's a big mess. So this card is an octofoil association. And this is uh, a movement in the Mekong Delta, marshlands. And this is also uh, one in the Mekong Delta by the same producer, Octafoil. And it was Operation Coronado 9. And that was an uh, attempt to dismantle communist strongholds in the Mekong Delta. There uh, were also individually produced postcards. Here's a real photo postcard made from a um, black and white photo. And it was taken by a soldier. And he says so on the back. He says, I took um, these photos. This is a how howitzer. It's an efficient gun. So they uh, did have some capacity in some instances to um, get their own film produced and uh, um, or developed and then make some postcards. And this next one is same um, example of that. It's a real photo postcard of patients and visitors in a military hospital. Photographer and producer are not identified. Um, and the, this postcard was sent by a female physical therapist uh, from a hospital. And she states that uh, not all the people in the postcard are patients, some are visitors, obviously looks like the children maybe of that one patient or the family members. And, but it's a good example of uh, the urgency going on. She says, help, the fighting lull is over. We're getting lots of fresh ones, 12 hour shifts, a full hospital. And her narrative here talks about how the replacement who came left for R&R &R in three days, uh, for three days, and she's all by herself. She's had to train other GIs to help her. She's had to do a lot of improvising for equipment. 
And so you really get a sense of, um, you know, uh, uh, this particular uh, situation for her was um, very stressful. And in case you're wondering, there was a monument that was um, dedicated uh, years later in 1993, and this um, commemorates the contribution of the uh, women who served in the war. So we move to postcards um, about um, uh, from the states, um, training centers. And the one um, here is a sign located at the Fort Polk reception station. And it shows the emblems of the various units serving in Vietnam. And it was one of the largest uh, army training centers in the US and on the right, we show the screaming eagles um, and in action in Vietnam. If I can find my pointer, you can see this emblem here is also on the postcard over there. And so these training centers, a lot of them had mock Vietnamese uh, villages to do their training. And this is um, a postcard from uh, Fort Polk showing that. And then on the back, it says, I have very little time to write letters. That's no excuse for you not to write to me. We've had three mail calls and I've heard from no one. So once again, an example of how important mail was and, um, and, and postcards were part of that. Here is an in advanced infantry training in that mock Vietnamese village in Fort Polk. And here's another also um, but, um, of Fort Polk and the uh, Mock Village. Okay, this is Fort Jackson in South Carolina. This is a very large postcard. The four views uh, shown here are almost as large as a regular size postcard. So you once again have the Mock Villages. They're doing a house to house search. You've got the armored personnel carrier down on the left uh, going through some water. And then you have mock helicopters used to learn proper seating and combat positions. And this was a Dexter Press postcard. Here we have Fort Gordon in Georgia. And uh, this is a tank rolling through um, a, Viet, a simulated Viet Cong machine gun position. Also Dexter Press postcard. And here are uh, some aircraft that were used, um, postcards of aircraft used during Vietnam, we, the top one is a uh, troop carrying Huey, and that was the backbone of Viet the Vietnam War, and I think uh, we all kind of recognize that one, a very iconic uh, helicopter, very recognizable from uh, news stories. And then um, next to that is the uh, Sea Stallion, and then on the bottom is the El Toro uh, KC-130 Hercules transport plane. And finally, uh, we have the Chinook helicopter, very large postcard, and it was um, over the Hong Kong mountain, and that's where the base was. And you can see on this one that they have a very painted a very large um, e their emblem on the insignia was displayed on the side of the mountain. So I had to include um, this one because I'm a retired nurse. And I thought this was very interesting because it showed the trainees getting an immunization with the high speed air gun, which shows a needle system that had been developed. And uh, you could inoculate a lot of people in a short amount of time. But unfortunately, it was found only after being used for quite a um, considerable amount of time that that gun um, actually could pass along airborne pathogens. And so consequently, a lot of people did end up with things like hepatitis and it was discontinued, but not uh, until it had been used for quite some time. And so now we move to postcards that are um, not real photo postcards and they were produced, um, you know, uh, uh, to, they were provided to the soldiers there uh, for morale purposes and for patriotic purposes. And they're uh, showing uh, US Army. And there's several um, with this man with a mission logo. And they were used by the servicemen. This one, he kind of jokingly says, greetings from the frontiers of freedom. So a little maybe sarcasm there. But he says that he's at the Red Cross Club and they have 
free stationery, coffee, Kool-Aid, books, magazines, newspapers, music, and American girls. And he says, see you in 364 days. So another countdown. And then this one is actually in country. And it says, this is a good example of how the USA is trying to um, improve the image over here. Uh, and so uh, a serviceman is helping with a local infrastructure. And you probably could say that this was, uh, you know, somewhat of a showing a PR, PR move. And then there were postcards produced showing uh, South Vietnamese soldiers. And this one actually was used by a U.S. serviceman to send home. And it says, how are you? Fine, I hope. Well, I'm fine, I guess. And um, they're showing that they're also helping um, with infrastructure, helping to rebuild houses and bridges for the people. The North Vietnamese, they also produce some postcards. And this one is of a self-defense group. And then this one, also another student self-defense group. And I was surprised to see women in this postcard. And so these were some of the early cards that I saw um, showing women fighters. And that made me think, um, you know, since uh, the U.S. Uh, didn't have women in combat, how strange that might have been for soldiers to um, encounter that. And so there's actually um, quite a few postcards I came across that show women right alongside the men. And then this little booklet that I found um, actually profiled a particular um, tribe and, um, uh, you know, just hill people basically living uh, simple lives. They weave, they're going harvest tea, but they've gone up there and they're um, it, it, showing them how to shoot guns and be soldiers. And I thought that, you know, that's um, actually kind of sad, but the women were fighting alongside the men. They were recruited. There's a, a lot of um, artistically rendered postcards in that vein. And I think this one's particularly interesting. I think it's like, um, you know, a nationalistic uh, recruitment. You see these women with babies. And so, you know, you just have to wonder, um, uh, women and children, but they're soldiers. I don't, uh, can't begin to imagine how that all uh, sorted itself out. And then here are some postcards actually showing uh, women in combat. The men were also profiled and um, they, you know, some of these postcards were um, very nice um, artistic renderings. And I'm sure that they were used to, uh, you know, uh, improve um, the nationalistic feeling and uh, um, morale and keep people uh, motivated. Here's two more uh, male soldiers. So uh, the countries that were controlled by communism um, were in solidarity with North Vietnam and a lot of them produced postcards as well. These are from East Germany. They're not showing a, a, you know military scenes but just kind of nice um, artistic renderings of Vietnamese culture. And then of course the USSR was supporting North Vietnam and they produced a lot of postcards uh, in um, solidarity with North Vietnam. Here's some so soldiers. And then this one is a, a little bit more, um, uh, uh, you know, dramatic, and it's a female soldier with a fallen comrade. Then you get to the postcards that are uh, more blatantly anti-U.S., anti-war propaganda postcards. A lot of those were produced. And um, this one particularly is uh, very clear what they're suggesting. It's a 1966 Soviet anti-war propaganda postcard showing um, uh, death that the Americans are flying in death into um, uh, Vietnam. And then uh, this theme uh, is also reproduced in postcards and it's showing um, uh, that the uh, what happens to the civilian population, particularly women and children. 
and um, showing them being menaced by uh, planes and knives. And this is kind of in contrast with one of the cards. I'll go back to the Mike Roberts. This is one of his cards. And on the back, it says life goes on during war. And it shows a young child and there's a soldier. And, you know, the suggestion here is, well, you know, life just keeps going on. But uh, very different from um, these postcards that show how um, traumatic and terrorizing it is for children. And uh, this postcard on the left is from 1966, but it seems eerily uh, pres prescient and similar to the iconic photo that came to be known as Napalm Girl. And that's when um, uh, there was um, a village that was bombed with napalm by the North Vietnam, Vietnam Air Force. And this particular young child, uh, she took her clothes off to stop further burning um, from the napalm that was on the clothes. And a, a photo was taken of that. And um, the photographer, Nick Oot, he, um, he debated whether to produce that photo um, or to publish it, you know, because the young child was unclothed, but decided that it was just too important um, a photograph, and he got a Pulitzer Prize for it, and it was titled The Terror of War. This iconic image um, is well known now, It's con and it continues to be used to protest war. An artist named Banksy used it um, to... Um, to as a commentary against the invasion of Iraq, he called it Napalm 2004, and it's uh, a commentary against the military industrial complex that companies actually profit from uh, war. And along those same lines, uh, this poster, um, I decided at one point that I should also try to collect uh, other ephemera and poster art. Uh, was in, very important to this time period and tells us a lot about what was going on in the hearts and minds of people. And so on the left is actually a poster um, that was uh, silk screened on old computer paper. It was attributed to the UC Berkeley students around 1970, and it has replaced uh, napalm, Coca-Cola with napalm and it's a uh, takeoff on the ad campaign that was popular at the time for Coke, it's the real thing. And the Coca-Cola company had the government contract to supply soft drinks to the military. And they were all, they were very involved in, um, you know, promoting uh, the war. So kind of along that same line of war and profit, uh, we get a postcard that was um, produced by Mothers of Servicemen calling attention to the fact that the military industrial complex was basically undermining the war effort. And we have the cross symbolizing a soldier killed in Vietnam. And it says by a Russian bullet from a Russian gun um, because the uh, US was um, involved in trade with the uh, satellite, the countries under the USSR control. And so, you know, those profits just get pumped right back into North Vietnam because the um, USSR was supporting them. Same idea with this postcard. Would you give blood to the Viet Cong? Well, of course you wouldn't give blood to the Viet Cong, but this postcard on the back lists the items the US government had approved to sell to the USSR. And so in turn, of course, they supply North Vietnam. And so um, it was also another, produced by a mother's group, and it says, U.S. Army medic motions for help from a war in which Washington won't permit our boys to win. Same idea here, uh, two-headed uh, dragon of communism. We're feeding the one end while we're fighting the other, and that was also produced by the Mother's Crusade. And these postcards obviously were meant to to be used to, you know, write to your representative, the president, senator, uh, you know, whoever might be in a position to um, to change the circumstances. So I um, this postcard is a more modern postcard. Obviously, it's got a website on there, um, but this group is uh, still in existence. Another mother for peace. 
was a very local um, group. It um, originated in Berkeley. And the artwork was um, original artwork. This was a very popular poster, War is Not Healthy for Children and Other Living Things. And so um, that was also turned into jewelry that was popular and worn by a lot of people um, during the era. And I think this uh, poster harkens back to a lot of the postcards that we just looked at uh, with, um, you know, uh, the women and children being um, deleteriously affected by the war. So this postcard um, is kind of an ironic take on a phrase that was basically, if not coined by Nixon, then popularized by Nixon. He used the term the silent majority in a televised address on November 3rd, uh, 1969. Obviously, uh, the irony here, the silent majority, these um, uh, it's a graveyard, so uh, nobody has a voice left um, from the grave. And but what he was referring to was um, he felt that there were a majority of Americans who uh, supported him and the war effort. They just weren't loud and out there, um, you know, protesting. And um, they were um, overshadowed by the media and the vocal minority. So this postcard uh, was a way uh, it's addressed directly to President Nixon. And so it was, um, you know, used, uh, supposed to be used to um, protest the war. There were postcards. Uh, this was also uh, Mothers of Servicemen to draw attention to the POWs and um, try to advocate for um, working toward getting them home. And this a similar postcard. This one has a pre-printed narrative meant to be sent to the um, uh, Vietnamese ambassador to urge him to accelerate efforts to have the POWs released. And this one profiles uh, a particular soldier. And, and I think that harkens back to the idea of the individual. You know, we have to um, bear in mind that um, each, uh, each person is an uh, individual and his life matters. And so I don't know who produced this postcard, but uh, possibly his family or his immediate community. And that was meant to be sent to a senator. And so that also um, brings to mind um, this, um, the POW MIA bracelets that were introduced by Voices Vital in America organization. And that was, the purpose was to increase the awareness of the plight of the prisoners. And they were to be worn um, by a person and then returned uh, to the POW when he uh, returned home or given to the POW when he returned home. And this one is um, appealing to people to help the paralyzed veteran, possibly an appeal for uh, monetary donations. So there were demonstrations, both, um, well, a lot of demonstrations against the war, but there were demonstrations also in support of the war. And um, this one, a woman shows support for the troops, and that was um, at the Oakland Induction Center for um, Stop the Draft Week. And then um, the one on the right was actually a pro-Vietnam War demonstration in New York. So this postcard is interesting. It says uh, New York City protest rally, um, protecting the rights of citizens to peaceably assemble, says the police are protecting their rights. And I'm thinking this might have been kind of a PR uh, postcard because of course there were a lot of clashes between protesters and police. And um, possibly the worst uh, incidents of that and I'm sorry for the poor quality. This is just a photo of a poster I had at one time and then I uh, didn't keep it. And that was before I decided I needed to start um, saving uh, posters too. But on May 4th in 1970, um, the Ohio National Guard actually opened fire on demonstrators on the campus of Kent State 
and they killed four and wounded nine other unarmed university protesters. And um, so this, of course, uh, traumatized a generation of anti-war protesters and students across the country engaged in the largest national student protest in US history. So um, it inspired a song um, by Neil Young of Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young called Ohio and the Tin Soldiers and Nixon are coming and four dead in Ohio. So here's a photo actually of one of the students that was shot. That was a very iconic photo. And um, the line of the song keeps reporting four dead in Ohio. So the draft was another um, big uh, divisive factor of the war and protests against the draft sometimes resulted in uh, acts of civil disobedience. This particular act, the Milwaukee 14, um, was probably one of the more radical um, uh, acts because um, 14 people removed 10,000 draft files from the Selective Service and burned them with their homemade napalm. So why was the draft um, so divisive? Uh, well, it was uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, one, firstly, that they felt that it was um, unfair that people of privilege um, uh, could find their way from serving or at least um, not serving in the most dangerous um, areas. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King referred to the Vietnam War as the white man's war, but a black man's fight. And this poster that we have from Nancy Redden's uh, war, um, Vietnam War archive shows um, racism is a Green Beret fighting and dying in Vietnam. And um, there was uh, um, the percentage of African Americans in the ground combat battalions was 31%, but of course their percentage just in the general population was 12%. And this was true for a lot of the other minorities. They, um, you know, they were serving in greater numbers than just in the general population. And so um, because of this uh, perceived unfairness about the draft, the draft lottery was started in 69. And what that did was it took a year, um, one birth year, through all the dates of that year, 365 into a barrel, they would pull these birth dates out. And if your birthday was pulled first, you would be drafted first. And they thought that this would reduce the um, idea that um, the draftees were coming disproportionately from the poor working class, rural and minority populations. So here are two posters one showing a kind of very dramatic uh, illustration of the hand of fate of the government coming down and uh, picking uh, people out based on their birth date. And so there, as a result, a lot of young men um, avoided the draft by leaving the country and many went to Canada. And here's a poster showing these two um, guys hitchhiking up to Canada, presumably to avoid the draft. As a result of the draft, well, we have this uh, very iconic and um, uh, familiar um, recruitment poster on the left uh, used uh, way back to World War I. And, and so that was being used in a way where they were modifying it and saying, um, Uncle Sam wants you, but now his uh, finger has turned into a gun and he's shooting bullets. And there were a lot of... Um, informational lectures going on to um, educate people about the draft because um, the rules of the draft, there were official rules and unofficial rules and they seem to change uh, a lot about, um, you know, where you get deferment for college. Um, Kennedy only, you know, he wanted uh, married men and men with children to um, be drafted last. So there was a lot to learn about, um, you know, what your rights were and, and what it meant. And um, so uh, here's another one uh, um, showing um, an educational seminar about the draft. And then on the right, that's a pin back button. And it's just another image showing Uncle Sam now pointing a gun at you. 
So uh, some people said, don't be a draft dodger, uh, resist the draft. You know, they don't have a right to do that to you. But many people as a result, David Harris kind of, he, he was an activist in that regard. And he kind of led that um, uh, uh, thought to resist the draft. Well, he actually was imprisoned as were a lot of men. And he was married to Joan Baez at the time. She wrote a song uh, for David um, talking about waiting for him for the time that he was in prison. Recruitment posters kind of ran the gamut. You have the traditional one on the um, left, but the one on the right kind of amuses me. They're using um, artwork that was popular, a style that was popular at the time, pop art. And I, you'd almost want to call it um, fake news because I, I doubt there was a lot of, uh, got some folk singing going on in there. And I, I you know, don't really know how much of that was going on. Um, and then, of course, you've got the recruitment posters that show travel. Well, during the war, I don't know, you know, if that was going to be the, your main uh, uh, focus there uh, was joining the Navy for the, the, the travel challenges. And this uh, poster from Nancy Redden's collection, I think, is kind of a ironic take on that, kind of poking fun at that uh, in a sarcastic way. Visit fascinating Vietnam, fun capital of the world. So uh, mocking these uh, recruitment posters. And then you had a lot of uh, poster art that um, was uh, attacking the leaders of the time. This is against uh, Johnson. And the sad irony of his presidency is that, um, you know, ramping up um, our uh, um, presence in uh, Vietnam had a negative effect on the demographic he was targeting to help you know, the economically disadvantaged and minorities, but he didn't think he would have a political capital to get his domestic agenda accomplished if he wasn't winning in Vietnam. And that agenda, of course, he called the Great Society. And he, he did get a lot of things accomplished, you know, civil rights bill and so forth, but it was all overshadowed by the war. And Nixon was also vilified. On the left is a, a poster that I have most likely created by UC Berkeley students, uh, turning Nixon uh, into a swastika. And on the right is a, a Cuban poster art um, against Nixon. So a very important um, election was in 72, both candidates were pledging that they were gonna end the war. Um, on the left, George McGovern, you see the peace sign, uh, peace emblem in the back there. Uh, this is not a campaign poster for Nixon on the right. It's a caricature, but it's also showing that he's saying he wants to end the war. He's flashing what you might think is the peace sign with his other hand, but actually in this case, it's probably V for victory because he used to um, do that a lot in campaigns. And um, uh, that hand gesture used to mean victory, and that was popularized by Churchill in World War II but then it switched over to um, mean the peace sign by the Vietnam War. So we see other iconic figures. There's this postcard on the left showing a Statue of Liberty, support our men in Vietnam, but on the right, we're using the Statue of Liberty in an um, ironic way uh, to suggest that it's the um, opposite of liberty, that we, uh, we have a, a grim reaper figure uh, leading people. And then on the left, a postcard that's kind of a, you know, a love it or leave it with traditional iconography using the flag. And then on the right, uh, the flag has been changed in an anti-war message uh, showing that um, the flag represents uh, war. And I always thought that the peace sign um, had been created in response to the Vietnam War, but I um, learned that no, it was actually created earlier in the 50s by an anti-nuclear activist, Gerald Holton, and it's based on the semaphore alphabet. It's an upside down Y, and that's the flag signals for ND, standing for nuclear disarmament. This is uh, just some funny little ephemera I found online that was uh, used for educational purposes, but uh, it was a pretty good uh, summation of the um, 
peace symbol, which of course became very ubiquitous during the Vietnam War. And it was, uh, patches were made and it was um, on clothing. People wore pinbacks. Here's a black light poster. And that's um, showing the, the V, I guess, for the, the um, old symbol of it, meaning victory, but then also peace. So um, here we have a modified uh, peace, uh, peace sign. And this is called the teardrop peace sign. And this poster, I think, um, shows us that these were very turbulent times. Not only was the war going on, but you know we were having our leaders assassinated, um, so there was violence. And this um, picture with the assassinated leaders, there's one little empty spot um, there that's kind of ominous because uh, it's almost like saying, well, who's next? And then we have this cemetery um, uh, imagery here. And, and so this was also a popular uh, necklace worn at the time. So the cemetery uh, imagery, like I said, was popular, popular in postcards. We have, we are the unwilling, led by the unqualified to do the unnecessary for the ungrateful. Um, kind of says a lot right there. And then this poster was actually, um, a poster art was often um, included in record albums. And this was included in a Chicago album. So finally, this last poster, this is from Nancy Redden's collection. This is from a very uh, pivotal, pivotal, one of two pivotal marches. And it was the second of uh, the two massive marches against the Vietnam War, October 15th and November 15th, 1969. And um, these two nationwide marches helped to end the draft and convince Nixon to um, step up the withdrawal of the troops. Prior to that, I think he was still thinking he had his um, silent majority behind him. But millions of people attended these marches, and it wasn't just the students and, and whatnot. As you can see in this service, we even heard recently in a documentary, Nixon was actually thinking he um, was going to increase his attacks on North Vietnam and maybe even use nuclear weapons, and that that would bring the war to an end faster. But these marches really showed him, no, there was a pretty uh, unified sentiment against the war. And so um, he stepped up his withdrawal of the troops. So on um, March 29th, 1973, two months after signing the peace, uh, Paris Peace um, Agreement, uh, the last US combat troops left South Vietnam. Of course, the communists vi violated the peace agreement and war resumed between the North and the South and Saigon fell to the communist forces in 75. But the US was out of the war. And that's the end of my program. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Kind of long. Um, Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no. No, it, it, it was great. Now that uh, now that her talk is over, if anybody has any questions or comments, uh, you're welcome to unmute yourself and uh, and talk, please. Pal, uh, I was uh, really taken with your man uh, in the mission uh, postcards, the poster. I have collected those. It was Don Preziosi that told me about him years ago. And, you know, all before computers and all before eBay. And they were so tough to find. For, for one thing, postcard dealers usually didn't have modern postcards in their selection. So you had to just luck out to luck into it. And uh, the same thing goes on eBay today. You don't see them very often, but sometimes uh, there will be one or two of those. But you had some, I to me, really tough ones in there that <laughs> I'm not sure that I've seen yet. But I took pictures of them to <laughs> be able to double check. Well, I really have to. I didn't give um, uh, collection credit to my fellow um, a club member in San Francisco, Dan Cudworth, but most of those, I have 
I, I have about three of them, I think. Yeah. And many of those are from his collection. Yeah. And actually, um, yeah, he, he has um, he has cards you're just not going to be able to find these days. Isn't yeah. that wonderful? Great. Yeah. Thank you for collecting them and giving. This was a powerful <laughs> program. It was wonderful. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Couldn't agree more. That was uh, that was a great one, Lauren. That, a lot of stuff went on that I uh, was, you know, obviously never saw before, and also never heard before. But one thing I was curious about was, I I thought that uh, women were involved in the war in North Vietnam, but I didn't know that they were draftable or involved as much in South Vietnam. Uh, do you know if they? if that was the case or was it all north vietnam women that were involved in it the on, the post, only postcards that i have with women in them were all north vietnam now i'm trying to remember from the ken burns series about vietnam he interviewed a lot of um people from you know all sides of the war and i'm trying to remember if there were any uh women for south vietnam and i I don't think there were, but I'm no expert. But my postcards only show North Vietnam. All right. Thank you. Any other any other uh, questions for Lauren? Please hello? raise your hands. Oh, go go ahead, Don. Well, that was a superb presentation, just incredible. I hadn't Thank even you. thought of it if there were any made. Now, do you suppose they had a similar bunch of cards for the Korean War? Would anybody collect those? I can't remember. I never got one. And there weren't very many from the Second World War either. I have very few cards from the Second World War. And of course, the First World War, there's an overwhelming number of cards. Right. The ones I remember from, you know, the Second World War, all those, you know, kind of comically drawn yes, cards and things. Something. Yeah, things like that. I also, in the local Five and Dime, they had a lot of... Uh, uh, lithographed cards of, of yeah. airplanes and ships and things. Yeah, but not real photo. Yeah, I don't no, come across a lot of real photo. I even have two cards from the Mexican American War, <laughs> which are extremely rare too, I suppose. Yeah, I would imagine. <laughs> anyway, it's wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was a very nice presentation. I noticed that two of the first postcards that you show they were mailed not to United States, but to Austria. Uh, right. I um I think those ones you were referring to the, they, the young man is writing to his sister who's going to get married. Yeah. So the only thing I could think was maybe she was marrying an Austrian and you know they were getting married in Austria. But it's the only it's the only two I noticed that they were she was writing and they were from so the sister was either. It was his sister. Yeah. The oh, other sorry. ones uh, not mailed home were the man writing to his little boy and he lived in England. So oh, well, yeah, they were, well, he was, his son lived in England because he was writing them to England. So not sure why. <laughs> that, that was interesting. I was, I was thinking the same thing. It was kind of unusual to see those cards going off to Europe. Mm -hmm. That's, that was I'm glad you asked that question. And they were, you know, since they didn't have to use postage, no. uh, I guess it still worked to be going other than back to the United States. So that was curious to me as well. Right, right. We'll have to ask some stamp people about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they they would be the ones to know. Actually, Patrick's with us. Do you know the answer to that, Patrick? Unmute yourself. No, I, I don't offhand. Sorry. Okay. Just curious about that. Glad to help. <laughs> I, I appreciate it, Patrick. It's good to see you, by the way. See you got on a little late, so I didn't greet you, but it's good to have you there. And also, Walt, it's great to see you, Walt. I, I, put, see on you. The, I put on the chat, I read a book um, recently. It's called The Mountain by Sing, Sing Bai Buen. Um, I mean, is the mountain sing and uh, is written from the point of view of the North Vietnam. 
That must have been Amazing. really interesting. And that is, I thought, I found it a fascinating book. Yeah. That's what kind of inspired me to, um, you know, try to get postcards from all sides was actually the Ken Burns um, documentary. If any of you have watched that, it's it's pretty yeah. in depth, and um, he does interview, you know, people who who uh, were involved from all the different groups. So you know, you get uh, you get a perspective. You were you were talking at the beginning of your talk. You were talking about the Vietnam uh, Memorial, and I I tell you, having the opportunity to uh, actually be there and walk around Washington in general, that that um, I mean, if that doesn't get your attention going up to that wall, nothing does. It's just a wonderful thing, and how anybody would have thought to be against it is just beyond me. Yeah, I mean, it was apparently quite controversial at the time. Yeah. And um, yeah, um, so uh, to, to the point that um, that they built uh, the other adjacent monument to it that's near it of the, the three um, servicemen, you know, to satisfy those who needed something more traditional and, you know, from their mind, a heroic uh, rendering that what a memorial should look like. Right, right. Well, both of both of those monuments are beautiful, but uh, the the wall. When you walk up to see all those names, boy, it's it really gets you powerful. Yeah, powerful. From every I haven't I haven't been, but from every one you know that I have um, talked to who's been there, it's um, powerful. You're welcome to to come this this way. I'm Almost did. I, I had a I had a I had a trip planned in 2020 and then COVID oh, came. So. <laughs> Thank you. Well, don't don't change your plans. Be sure to go if you can because I will. It's, it, it's yeah. a sight to see. Let me know if you're coming. Thank you. Huh. I appreciate that. For those that are um, interested in the uh, philatelic aspect, there was a airlift stamp that was sent when people sent packages from the United States to Vietnam. It was called the Vietnam Airlift Stamp. And if you can get one of those that's been canceled, then you have one that actually went to Vietnam and then came back with, with the soldier. Mm. You can usually find them uncanceled, but a canceled one is, is much more valuable. Wow, that's good to know. I saw you had a question, Patrick. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to comment that um, yeah, the I think it was in the it had to have been in the early '90s or so, uh, maybe the late '80s. They had a traveling Vietnam veteran or Vietnam oh. uh, wall that was pretty. They still interesting. do. I think they still do. You know, I think uh, there's a couple of them actually, but. Yeah, it's neat that they they have that. It's such an important monument. Yeah, and it translates well. Instead of just a um, big monument of some sort, mm -hmm. that they can have a version of it that travels. And, you know, um, in preparation for this program, I watched a YouTube video produced by the the group that actually raised the money and you know picked the plan and and. Um, and got the monument built, um, a very nice uh, YouTube informative um, video about the wall, uh, very well produced. And they talked about that traveling wall in that. So you should look it up. I think it's worth watching. That's on, that was on PBS, right? Um, just on U YouTube. And, oh, on YouTube. Yeah, and okay. I can't... Um, can't remember the name. I should have been prepared and had the name of it, but maybe it's the Wall Walk or something. But it's produced by the you know the group that actually raised all the money and 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 got it built. Yeah, it's uh, great. I just can't thank you enough, Lauren. I've been looking forward to this, and it was just fantastic. Thank, thank you so you. much for doing it for us, and uh, thanks to all of you for coming. I'm 